I believe in the concept of burn the boats. If you're going to go, you're going to start a business, you're going to go for it, go all in. Because if you're thinking about a plan B, you know, when it gets tough, it gets hard, you might not be as resourceful. Whereas, you know, for me now, quit my job. I'm fully invested in this financially. Mm-hmm. Like I have nowhere else to go. So mm-hmm. this is it. And so when we hit a hard time, my back's up against the wall, forced to find creative ways to solve problems. Yeah. When you're competing with, you know, big companies that have more resource and, ha- and have more right. financial backing, you know, you have that that nitty gritty, you know, fight and hustle in you that can't be replicated. Hello and welcome to episode number 45 of the Rose Bros podcast, where the idea is to connect with other entrepreneurs, athletes, and cool people in general to help you learn a thing or two. All the while, enjoying some smooth Rose Bros coffee. This episode, we are joined by entrepreneur Mitch Jacobson, CEO and founder of Revita Energy Tea. After graduating with a degree in petroleum engineering, Mitch spent the first few years of his career in the energy industry. However, after a close friend's heart attack, part of which was attributed to unhealthy energy drinks, Mitch thought there had to be a better product that supplied energy that was also made of healthy ingredients. Mitch used his experience in sports combined with a lot of trial and error in the lab to create a low sugar energy tea made to help give you a little energy when you need it most without the crash and unhealthy ingredients. Fast forward a few years and Revita Energy Tea is now sold in 300 stores across Canada with major plans going forward. Along with co-founders Carly Jacobson and Robert Wig, Revita is soon planning to launch in the USA as well as further expand in more stores in Canada, all the while reducing their environmental footprint. It was a cool episode as we talked about the dangers of too much sugar, scaling a business, having an idea versus execution, burning the boats and going all in, good business books, and a lot more. Enjoy. Mitch Jacobson, I really appreciate you doing this. Hey, Trevor. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. I know you're really busy, so to take an hour out of your day is a big ask, and, uh, <laughs> but that's a good thing. I don't know about busy, but definitely <laughs> disorganized. <laughs> well, we're here again at the Weeds Cafe. Unfortunately, we're not drinking either of our products, but that's okay. What are you going to do? <laughs> what are you going to do, hey? Supporting other local small businesses. So. Yeah, exactly. So you are the CEO and founder of Revita Tea? You nailed it. Yeah, not many people get it on the first try, but it's Revita Energy Tea, and okay. Revita is short for the word revitalize. Okay. And how did you guys come up with the name and kind of give us background on the company a little bit? Revita Energy Tea is a refreshing blend of black tea, organic honey, and some fruit juices. It's a really healthy you know, pre-workout or afternoon pick-me-up. It's got about as much caffeine as a medium cup of coffee, so it's just clean, sustainable energy. And how we came up with the idea is I actually had a friend that had a heart attack from energy drinks. I ended up driving him to the hospital. He was in his early 20s, and that was the catalyst. You know, why, what is bridging this gap between, you know, coffee and chemical-filled energy drinks? Right. You know, why is there not a healthy alternative to the chemical, sugar-filled stuff that's out there? We couldn't find one, so, you know, went to work in my kitchen, and a few years later, here we are. Originally, you were an engineer. You, I think, did engineering at UC? That's right, yeah. So I'm a petroleum engineer by trade. I worked for Tourmaline Oil, an amazing company, for yeah. five years and, and went from that right into this full time. And it's been an incredible journey. I met you through Marty Staples. <laughs> Shout out to Marty Staples if you're listening. I uh, really appreciate it. <laughs> Shout out to Marty. He's a legend, I tell you. <laughs> but yeah, you grew up in Calgary? and Grew up in Calgary, okay. born and raised. How about yourself? Mm. I'm actually from Invermere, BC. No way. Yes. Came here to go to school. UFC business and kind of just stayed and here we are, more or less. Did oil and gas for a while like you and so that's how I know Marty. (laughs) Yeah. Interesting going from oil and gas to the the beverage and and food world. Yeah. Consumer goods. (laughs) How about growing up? Are you a sports guy or would you, because I know you got an athletic background. So grew up playing basketball here in the city. Yeah. And learned so much about from sports that I'm now able to apply to business. So it's it's pretty incredible how you know ten years later from the end of my basketball career, I'm able to apply those same leaderships and competitive lessons. Did you always want to be an entrepreneur growing up? Have your own business? So I always you know knew from the time I was a little kid that I wanted to do something entrepreneurial. To begin, I thought it was going to be in basketball. So I thought you know I was going to you know 
hopefully play professional basketball or do something basketball related. And when, you know, I kind of hit a crossroads in my life and it was time to walk away from the game, that's when I decided it, I really wanted to do my own thing and, and create something of value that would help people in the world. So you started at Tourmaline, kind of got a job right at school. Were you always kind of thinking you wanted to do your own thing eventually or was it see where it went? Well, I love Tourmaline because it's it has a very entrepreneurial yeah, culture, right? Sure. It's just an incredible company founded by some extraordinary individuals who are you know, some of the greatest entrepreneurs in the world, yeah. I believe. And so I wanted to work there and really learn from them with the goal of one day, you know, being able to do my own thing. And maybe that'd be in oil and gas. And it happened to be uh, also in the energy space, just the energy beverage space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever think about trying to start your own oil company? That was a dream of mine growing up because I'm fourth generation oil and gas. You know, my father, my really? grandfather is, uh, and his father was in oil and gas. So I thought that was going to be the direction I went, but I found a, a calling, like I said, with my friend who had a heart attack and decided I was uh, still going to stay in energy, just a little bit different. So what did your dad say when you said you were going out of oil and gas and doing something else? <laughs> you know, my dad's uh, an incredible entrepreneur and, and he <laughs> understood the mission and he understood the the passion. And I think he was just so excited that I'm going to venture out and do my own thing. And he's been my most incredible support. And my mother and him have been phenomenal. So you started the company while you were moonlighting at Tourmaline, more or less, uh, when you got going? Yeah, so I was working at Tourmaline, and it started as really just a hobby. Like, I you know, was crafting stuff in my kitchen on the weekends, and I figured out pretty quick, I have no idea what I'm doing in the beverage yeah. space. Like, how do you start a beverage company, right, yep. if you think about it? Oh, yeah. Started with a Google search. And so shortly after that, I, I got a food scientist in Vancouver to help me out. And like I said, it kind of started as almost a passion project, you know, going back and forth with this food scientist working on the formula. And then you know, we launched to markets in October of, of 2019, and it just took off from there. And I'm very blessed that I got an opportunity now to do this full time. And so how long did it take before you realized maybe you could quit your quote unquote day job? You know, what? you get to a point where... I love the company that I was working for and I had to be fair to them. And I wanted to make sure that when I was there at work that I was giving them my all. And if it got to a point where I felt like I was being pulled in too many directions, that was the time to step away. Because yep. I always wanted to put them first because mm -hmm. Tormeline gave me so many opportunities. And so when I got to a point where I felt like I was just being pulled too many different directions, I felt like the best decision for not only Revita, but for Tourmaline was to step away and, and focus on Revita full time. And Tourmaline was just an absolutely incredible company. And they were so gracious when they, when I uh, stepped away and I still keep in touch with, with many of them, including Marty. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Is it stressful when you got the company going? Does it involve a big loan or was it, did you kind of scale it as you went? Yeah, so it was really capital intensive. The beverage industry is very expensive. You got to pay for food science up front. You got to pay for packaging. You got to pay for ingredients. So it's it was a, a massive investment, and I actually initially financed it with a student line of credit that I still had coming out of university and, and just uh, found creative ways to finance it since the inception of the company. So how much are we talking, like 10, 20, 30 grand? Oh, hundreds of thousands hundreds? to get it off the ground. Yeah. Really? yeah, I would say the rule of thumb and beverage, if you want to do a regional launch, is a half a million. We bootstrapped it, you know, a fraction of that, but it was really? still well into the six figures to, to kind of get things off the ground. So what did you put that money into? Was it inventory up front or R&D? Yeah, a lot of R&D. Uh, so you got to pay a food scientist to help formulate the drink, which you need a retainer generally up front to get them working on your product. Right. And then you got to invest. It's the minimum quantities, which I'm sure you know from the coffee business. Yeah. I can't just order 500 packages. I got to order 11,000 or 15,000 yep. oftentimes is a minimum. Yeah. So you're investing sure. these, massive, <laughs> these massive minimum quantities. And you got to operate by faith at the beginning. Yeah. That's for sure. So you had all this money put into inventory and R&D and whatnot. And were you kind of hoping for a secret formula of some sort? Or did you know? Or was it kind of just see how it went? <laughs> I think my greatest resource was my ignorance in a way. Because okay. if I came from the food space, I maybe never would have started this. Because yeah. You would know how many steps that you have to go through, and mm -hmm. I just really didn't, you know, know what I was doing, and and got into it. And we weren't necessarily looking for a secret formula, but we just, 
I gave my food scientist a, a list of ingredients I wanted to work with that I felt were, you know, wholesome, natural, good ingredients. Mm-hmm. And it took the better part of two years working with them, revision after revision mm. to perfect, you know, what we have today and get the taste and the function just right. So how many iterations did you go through? We probably went through 20 or more. It yeah. was massive. Like every month. So how it would work is my food scientist was in Vancouver. Mm-hmm. So I'd send them what I wanted. She'd ship me samples here to Calgary. Mm-hmm. I'd have my all my friends and family over. We'd do mm-hmm. a blind taste test. So I'd put, you know, my beverage in cups versus Red Bull and Monster and vitamin mm-hmm. water and, and things like that. And everyone would rank them. Mm-hmm. And we just did that over and over again. And it started, you know, when we did my very first taste test, I was dead last. And by the end of it, I was consistently beating every other drink. That's cool. And so it was just a very iterative, time consuming process, mm-hmm. but so rewarding to, you know, take the time to get it right. Thankfully, you had a good job while you're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Pay the bills. You betcha. <laughs> yeah. Would have been stressful if you'd didn't have that to fall back on a lot of money out the door there's a lot of money out the door like i said i think you're operating on faith and ignorance was probably my greatest resource so things started to click you got a good recipe together and but originally you kind of put everything like the story is your friend had suffered a heart attack from too many energy drinks so that was the motivation more or less that was really a big part of the why is you know there's these energy drink brands, they're, they're incredible brands. They've done a wonderful job, but I, you know, I do believe that there needs to be some healthy alternatives, mm-hmm. right? With low sugar, yeah. natural ingredients, natural caffeine. I could never find it. I was looking for one myself, you know, working long days at oil and gas. Mm-hmm. It's 2 PM. You hit a crash, you're, you're crashing. You need something, you know, co- you sometimes, you know, you drink coffee in the morning, you want something else in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. What else is there? Mm-hmm. I couldn't find it combined with my friend that got sick that was the you know the why i wanted to create a product that really helped people with good ingredients and coffee wasn't cutting it <laughs> shout out to rose bros coffee yeah. no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> coffee i just, we were sitting here drinking coffee right now yeah. i love coffee you know still drink it in the morning but it's that afternoon right when you want mm-hmm. some variety mm-hmm. and that's what i was looking for and that was the the motivation behind it the friend who passed away the heart attack was directly attributed to too much yeah he fortunately survived but he did have a heart attack in his early 20s that was attributed to energy drinks so he oh, had man. just literally consumed four or five that day and <laughs> consumed a, a few too crushed, many yeah. and there's chemicals such as taurine mm-hmm. and whatnot in these energy drinks that combined with caffeine and high levels of sugar mm-hmm. are probably not the best thing to to be putting in our bodies and that's you know we wanted to create something that had natural caffeine natural ingredients really low sugar that was kind of the moment when you started looking for the recipe and maybe thought there was a opportunity there i think that was the real kind of you know light bulb going off moment per se where i said okay you know there's a there's a problem here i absolutely love coffee i love your brand what else is there in the afternoon that can kind of bridge that gap between, you know, coffee and, you know, energy drinks, mm-hmm. right? And there's nothing out there. There's really nothing out there that my, met my needs, was branded for professionals. And then, you know, coming from an environmental background, I was in doing water sustainability engineering. Mm-hmm. I saw problems with conventional packaging. So cans and glass bottles, right? Mm-hmm. Cans are great because they're infinitely recyclable, but they got to be shipped fully formed. So think of the carbon emissions of these empty cans being trucked all over North America. We found this flexible beverage package, which we use for Revita Energy Tea, and it saves so much carbon, you know, in terms of its life cycle. So I saw that side of the equation too, and there was a problem there that, that could be solved. Things started to pick up and you got into a few stores. What was it like? getting in your first few locations was that tough it was tough right as as you know when you're a new brand and nobody knows who you are those first yeah. few cold approaches going into stores did you do it yourself we did it ourselves yeah. yeah so it was literally walking into our first store was a, a sock store called planes breaker in the core mall we put a little fridge in this you know sock and clothing store really? and that was our first retail <laughs> location and shortly after that, we got into Amaranth and Blush Lane and some incredible local health food stores yeah. here in, in town. And it's uh, really grown from there. And now you're in a bunch of grocery stores I've seen. Yeah, we're in. Uh, we're just about to celebrate our 300 store mark. And That's cool. Yeah, we're, we're really pushing the goal. And in 2021 here is 1,500. So we got a lot of growth and we got a lot of work to do to 
get the brand out there next year. How's it been scaling up? Has it been difficult scaling? Because I know some businesses, that's a challenge also. There's so many growing pains. Yeah. As you know, as an entrepreneur, you got to wear so many different hats, right? One day I'm the accountant, the next day I'm the janitor, the day after that I'm the receptionist. And you're still going to manage sales and operations. And I have an incredible team, Carly and Rob, my, my two other co-founders. And it's we're learning lots. We're actively trying to hire employees now and, and find a warehouse that we could work out of. Every day is a fun new adventure. It's been it's been great. Capital wise, have you kept it 100 percent yourself? Or you get raise money or debt? We've managed to keep it the three of us, and okay. then we have one investor. We've managed to keep the majority of the equity within within ourselves, and our goal is to hopefully debt finance this as as far as we can get to kind of bootstrap it. Yeah. Really try and bootstrap it and, and keep that hard earned equity. Banks like ATB have incredible programs for local entrepreneurs and we're trying to take advantage as much as we can of those. Do you make the product in Calgary then, or do you have a facility? We have a facility, a manufacturer that we work with in Burnaby actually. Oh, okay. So they make the product there because our packaging is so specialized and then all of our business operations are anchored out of Calgary. Okay. So we do all our distribution and everything out of the city here. Have you been able to get stuff like credit terms? How has that been for growing? Yeah. Uh, that was huge for Rose Bros. <laughs> so something simple as 30 days. You- as you know, that's the biggest challenge. Yeah. So you got to pay for a lot of our ingredients, packaging up front. Yes. And then you're getting, you know, net 30 days, which really t- quickly turns into net 60 and sometimes right. net 90. Do you so there's, net 90? We, there's some vendors occasionally where you're not paid for, you know, a long period of time. And that's something we're constantly trying to balance. Hmm. I remember reading, I think it was Dell Computers. Yeah. They grew because they always paid their suppliers after they got paid. Yes. They were able to establish that and that's how, how they grew. That's how they grew. Yeah. That's something that hopefully one day Rose Bros can do, <laughs> but you know, that's, it's tough. It's really challenging, especially as a startup and yeah. in this environment. And we just try and get creative, right? You know, sell it on our website and on Amazon, you get paid immediately. So that's a channel that you know, really helps cash flow. Right. It right. helps you kind of balance that. You know, so you guys are on Amazon? We're on Amazon. Yeah. We sell online as well, which has been great because our packaging, you know, unlike cans and bottles it's very durable so it ships really well and we've had a lot of success and we're so grateful for all the people that support us online what percentage is online versus in store right now probably about 20 percent online and then the remainder would be be in retail has covid affected that have you seen an increase in online sales we certainly have and we've actually seen you know an increase in our in-store sales too so really? people are yeah. are shopping more local than ever before i think there's this heightened sense of awareness that we need to help out you know our local companies and feel very blessed that you know stores like blush lane amaranth bite and inglewood all of these stores have really picked up because amazing people have supported us there when you do go to stores what would you say that differentiates you from a company like red bull the first and foremost thing is, you know, our packaging is in a flexible stand-up beverage pouch. No one's ever done it before. Yeah, That's a really that, clean yeah. white design. So we stand out on the shelf because of that. And then when you look at our ingredients, we, we use organic honey. We use caffeine from black tea. We use guarana seed from Brazil. We use vitamins. You know, there's no direct added sugar. You know, there's only fruit juices. So our ingredients are clean, simple things that everyone can recognize, right, on the back right. of the package. There's no... There's no chemicals or anything that we're adding that, you know, the average person wouldn't understand what that is. I see. So Red Bull has a lot of those ingredients that aren't so good for you. You know what? Red Bull is uh, an incredible product and they've they've really kind of blazed the way into the energy drink space. And But you know, a lot of them have, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's probably not the best thing for everyone to be putting in their bodies, right? Hmm. There's lots of sugar. There's some, you know, things on the back of the package that I don't understand what they are. Hmm. So... We really admire Red Bull as a brand, but we're trying to be in that health, you know, wellness professional space and create something that is clean alternatives to those ingredients. When you did start getting into stores, did you link up with a wholesaler? Are you doing all the sales yourself still? We went direct to store initially. So we were just self-distributing everywhere and we still do that to, you know, a certain number of accounts. But now we have uh, an amazing local distributor okay. that's been helping us, you know, scale across Canada. 
That makes your life a lot easier, I'd imagine. <laughs> it sure does. So you make it all in Burnaby. That's and, right. And then it all comes up to Calgary. Do you store it here? Or? Yeah. So it's all warehoused and distributed out of Calgary. That's been our, our distribution hub. And we ship uh, as far east right now as Ontario and Quebec. And then we have distribution kind of all throughout uh, Western Canada and all huh. the Western provinces here. Anyone popping up as far as competitors go? Is there anyone that's copied you? Uh, it's a good idea. People jump on it pretty quick. Have you noticed anything like that? You know what? We're, we're very unique with our packaging and our ingredients. So it would be very difficult to try and copy our, our branding, but there's certainly other, you know, beverages kind of in the somewhat healthy energy space but we feel like we're so far differentiated from those that we're really excited to see what the the future holds for us so nobody's cropped up out of nowhere kind of the same sort of brand or yeah and you know what it's i was naive too i thought i could get a beverage company off the ground in six months you know if you want to do it right you're probably looking at you know two to three maybe even four years you know to really do it right get the formulas right get the quality right because uh you got to have quality ingredients and quality packaging or it's it's not going to move in in stores right and your guys's recipe is proprietary more or less yeah more you know it's we we own that that formula and it's one thing that really shocked me coming from the engineering world was how specific creating this formula is like you can add one percent more juice and it totally changes the flavor and everything of the drink right so it's to recreate any awesome. beverage on the market isn't as easy as just buying those ingredients really? and, and blending them it, it it takes really specific ratios and science and understanding how ingredients interact with each other hmm. to get that formula right because you always read about knockoffs from china right maybe you're not that big yet you could speak some of these big energy drink brands yeah. right there's hundreds not thousands of other energy drinks but there's still two or three big brands that dominate so people can knock your product off but they can't knock off your brand and they can't knock off how customers feel about you and they can't knock off your customer service and the mission that you're on right Right. so someone could come up with an identical product but you know the way we treat customers the way we try and get back to the community our focus and our purpose would be very difficult to to recreate why do you think Certain energy drinks like Rockstar or Red Bull do become breakout successes. Like, why them? <laughs> yeah, well, they're they're brilliantly marketed, and right. I think any business can really look at you know what they've done. You look at Red Bull, Red Bull in the beginning, right, with their TV commercials and ads, and they focused on the problem they were solving, right? Even the you know the Red Bull gives you wings, like is there, people mm-hmm. understood what their product did and what problem it solved. Right. And so we're trying to, I don't want to say recreate it, but take that same kind of approach with that healthy space, right? We're mm-hmm. solving, we feel like a big problem. You know, people are looking for healthy. You know, clean, healthy sources of energy. So let's make sure that we convey the message that that's what we're doing. And we're doing it with integrity. We're doing it with a brand that wants to give back and, and help. A healthy energy drink, more or less. Yeah, you know, we even try and stay away from the word energy drink because I think there's so many uh, negative right. misconceptions, right? People that work downtown, for instance, perceive, you know, Monster and Red Bull to be things that aren't great to put in your body, which is good because there is ingredients in there that you probably shouldn't be Mm -hmm. drinking necessarily. And so, you know, we're an energy tea, right? We're using caffeine from tea, Uh, vitamins, clean ingredients. We're really trying to differentiate ourselves in that way. If you had three or four or five of these things, would they really get your heart rate going then? (laughs) Is that the idea? (laughs) Well, the beautiful... are you talking energy drinks um, or the your guys yeah energy drink. the beautiful thing about and i never understood this when i got into this is i would drink say an energy drink and it'd get me all hyped up and then i would crash yep and then i would drink it you know caffeine from tea and it would always just leave me feeling you know refreshed focused i wouldn't crash as hard hmm. and so when i did research tea naturally contains amino acids such as l-theanine which when combined with caffeine actually enhances the effects of it so you don't get that same crash you feel better for longer and then you add in you know natural amino acids that are contained in organic honey and really? guarana seed and when you mix that all together you we, we feel like we've created something where you get clean sustainable energy without the jitters without the crash because hmm. that caffeine isn't synthetic it's coming 
coming from things found in nature. So if you had two or three at, say, five o'clock, what would happen in that scenario? <laughs> <laughs> well, Health Canada, you know, fortunately regulates how much caffeine that, you know, we can recommend people consume. Okay. So 400 milligrams yeah, is the fair. maximum amount of caffeine that Health Canada recommends. Don't quote me on that. Yeah. That was the last time yeah. I checked. <laughs> so Revita contains 140 milligrams. So it's recommended by Health Canada that you don't consume more than two. Okay. Regularly consumed. You yeah. Know, more than that. Yeah, yeah. And I've never been left with the jitters or, or the crash. And I do truly believe it's because of the natural caffeine. Hmm. And you're not, it's only six grams of sugar from organic honey. Right. So you're not, you know, hitting your body with, you know, spiking your insulin levels with 40 or 50 grams Interesting. of synthetic sugars, right? Or refined sugars. My brother's a triathlete, more or less, and marathon runner. And he really measures his food and whatnot and yeah. the sugar intake for most people. Even on the packaging of a lot of foods, they it's not accurate on how much sugar humans, the average human should consume. So if you have like two or three power bars in a day, you're getting like 100% of your sugar intake, but they don't, they don't market it that way? Yes, exactly. You know, we originally started trying to craft it with zero grams of sugar. I wanted this to be a sugar-free product, right. but then I found the benefits of organic honey. And so we added just a little bit. And, hmm. and that's the beautiful thing about Robita. It's got six grams of sugar from organic honey and fruit juices and only 30 calories. Other energy drinks on the market sometimes contain 160 calories and 40 to 60 grams of sugar. Which is like 100% of your recommended daily sugar. 100% of your recommended yeah, daily sugar. It's, uh, it's crazy some of the products out there, you know, how much sugar they have. Because they recommend on the, some of these labels that you need like, say, 50 grams of sugar in a day, but in reality, you only need 30. Yeah. You know what I mean? I completely agree with that. Their recommendation is way higher so they can market their product better, essentially, right? Exactly. Exactly. And did you know that going into? We did know that. Yeah. So I have a bit of a nutrition, I don't want to say nutrition background, but I competed in men's fitness and men's physique. And hmm. so, oh, I so you knew, knew that. <laughs> I knew a little bit of, you know, what it took to, you know, cause I had to adhere to these, right. These diets to get myself on shape and lose a lot of body fat. And I understood how sugar, you know, played a role right. in, in your body and how it spikes your insulin levels yep. and how it's related to, you know, fat gain. And so, you know, my rule of thumb always was when I was in fitness is don't consume more than 30 calories from any beverage and no more than, you know, seven grams of sugar a day or per, per beverage. Right. right? And then per day. Yeah. That I think that 30 to 50 is probably yeah. a great, a great target depending on your, your health needs. Right. And so I brought that background uh, into the formulation of the beverage. So I don't think a lot of people understand that sugar turns into fat also. I didn't yeah, know that for a long time. I know, right? There's so many misconceptions about sugar and and uh, I really believe in controlling your sugar intake, understanding where your sugars come, the difference between a refined sugar and something like, say, organic honey or fruit juice, right. how your body responds to that. And so all of this went into the formulation of Revita. Does honey transform into fat not as easily as other sugars or is it just less sugar? How does that work? So... A typical, say, refined sugar, yeah. when it hits your bloodstream, this is my understanding. Again, I'm not a, yeah, not a doctor. I'm not a doctor <laughs> so, well, but it can really quickly spike your insulin levels, right? Yeah. And so when you're consuming 40 or 50 grams of that in a beverage, you know, you're spiking your insulin, which can be, you know, related to fat gain and can be converted into sugar. Organic honey, fruit juices can can naturally contain things found in plants which can slow that absorption oh, of the sugar so you're not getting not only you're not consuming as much right. sugars in one dose right. but it also contains other natural you know compounds and amino acids which should hopefully slow the release of that sugar so you're not just spiking your blood sugar all the time right yeah, I mean, I, for the longest time, assumed you got fat from eating things like chips and chocolate bars, which is sugar. But, you know, yeah. I didn't understand that sugar, maybe even fruit, can convert into fat, if you know what I mean. It certainly can. You betcha. And that's, if you consume, you know, more than your daily need for calories, and, you know, a lot of that's probably going to be carbohydrates for, you know, myself and a lot of people that gets direct, can be directly converted into fat. Yeah. And so we wanted to create a <laughs> beverage that was athlete it was great for athletes, right? Not only clean ingredients, but low calories, low sugar. Right. I've always thought it would be great in relation to that as a before bed snack. I don't know if you guys ever thought about that because it seems like everything I try and snack on before bed is 
packed full of sugar and keeps you up. And so maybe that's uh, provide his next product. But definitely, kind of yeah. Tangent, you know, I can't find anything that right before bed when you're hungry and there's low sugar and it's just an idea. <laughs> Certainly, I know back when I was competing in fitness, like you, yeah. coaches would always say like, cottage cheese or, or like dairy yeah. milk proteins because it contains, I believe. It's called casein protein, which is supposed to absorb slower. Hmm. And the theory behind that was, you know, while you're sleeping, it's going to digest slower and that protein yeah. is released. So I think higher protein, you know, lower carb yeah. products, the world needs more of those. But I, yeah, maybe that's the next Rose Bros product. We'll team up with you guys <laughs> or something. There you go. Before the bed, before bed <laughs> snack. <laughs> but seriously, I, I don't know. Bread, you don't want to eat. You don't want to eat peanut butter because there's sugar. Granola bars often have a lot of sugar. Exactly. I was watching the um, F1 series the other day and Rich Energy, have you ever seen that company, the one that sponsored that F1 team? I have not. Okay, I don't know. They came out of nowhere, put up this huge sponsorship behind the F1 team. And so I was interested to get your take on where they came from and why they were so successful. So one of the things I'm learning about food marketing is you got to be where the people are and you got to have people seeing your brand. Yeah. So obviously they're doing well if they can sponsor an F1 team. Well, they, yeah, yeah. Brilliant marketing play. And I think that's, you know, probably going to work out very well for them. And so we're, energy drinks, I think traditionally have really targeted the extreme sports, yeah. right? MMA, car racing. We're trying to go to where, you know, the health, healthy professional person that goes hiking on the weekends is so we're sort of targeting you know a different demographic hmm. and so instead of you know maybe sponsoring an f1 thing we're yeah. sponsoring like maybe you 100 know, million dollars yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're focusing more on like group fitness classes and, and other channels where we're finding more people that resonate with our product right well i guess these rich energy guys pulled out of the contract or whatever they're kind of sketchy but I was just curious how they became so successful. I mean, I guess they view sponsorships like that as valuable. I, I can understand why they would view that as valuable. You think if they sponsor an F1 team, there's $100 million worth of value coming out of that? I you know, know, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I it gets people out. seeing your brand and it's a lot of these big retail chains too, you know, like say big grocery stores, probably in Europe, throughout Canada and the U S and they're evaluating what products to put on the shelf because there's a limited space. Right. They want to choose the products that are best marketed and more, most likely to sell the most. Right. So if you can say that you've, you know, sponsored an F1 team and you have hundreds of millions mm. of people or millions of people seeing your brand, right. it should help you not only get on the shelf, but hopefully sell sell product but the thing is it's one thing to get someone to buy your product off the shelf once it's another thing to get them to to buy it again and again so you can have a poorly a poor product that's marketed right. great and it's going to die you have to have a great product that people are going to buy over and over again because right. they love it well i guess in the case of this rich energy company we're talking about it up here in canada right so yeah. successful <laughs> there's a good example we're talking about it now so yeah it's, uh, their marketing's working and then they got on netflix which is no way. Well, this F1 series is on Netflix. And so, I mean, that's huge. That's massive. Yeah. And they didn't have to pay. They pulled out of the contract. And it's still there, hey? Yeah. 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 They got on Netflix, pulled out of the contract, and didn't even have to pay. And now we're talking about it. Exactly. Creating word of mouth, yeah. you know, we found is the most valuable, important piece of marketing. So, anytime you can get people talking about your brand, and, and yeah. telling their friends about it, you know, that's how you grow a company. I mean, in the case of Red Bull, again, like an F1 team is so much money. Yes. But they must have a way to measure that ROI or they just do it for fun. I don't know. That always confused me too. And couldn't, like, how do you justify spending a yeah. hundred million dollars, right? And, you know, now that we're getting into this beverage space, we're in some stores. Yeah. Like it blows my mind how much money we have to spend on marketing and really? how many samples we have to give out because you just, you have to get people seeing your product so that they buy it in the store. Right. It's an overwhelming, you know, number or percentage of revenue sometimes that you need to invest yep. into marketing to make your company grow. You guys have a proprietary recipe. In the case of coffee, it's not exactly proprietary. That's, it's the brand. Yeah. yeah. And it's the same as I was saying. There's lots of beverages out there, but what separates beverages is yes, you got to have an amazing, incredible product, right? But you got to have a wonderful brand that right. really resonates with people and is really doing good in the world. At the end of the day, even a lot of it comes down to execution. 
I completely agree. And uh, my favorite entrepreneurial book is The Millionaire Fast Lane by MJ DeMarco. Yeah, yeah. Have you? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And there's that, that chapter in there where he talks about it's, it's not so much your idea, it's your execution. Right. right. And the value of your business is the value of the idea times the value of your execution. Right. So you can have a poor idea, but if you execute it better than everybody else, you know, you're going to win. And so I think even getting into this, like a healthy energy drink, it has been done before, right. and, you know, in a way, but we just wanted to do it way different. And, you know, we wanted our execution to be better and our focus is on one, create an incredible product, but two, make sure the execution is not only different, but we're executing better than, right. than our competition. I've noticed that often other companies that just certain things are no brainers. And if you're even somewhat on the ball, you can, you can execute better. Exactly. Have you, have you seen that with other companies out there? Yeah. Like Tourmaline, for instance. There's other oil companies out there, but for some reason, those guys just, they're so successful. You know what? That's the perfect example, yeah. I think. There's there's lots of other oil companies, but yeah. look at the executive team of Tourmaline and the, and the staff that's there, and I can speak to this firsthand. Right. They're an incredible group of people. They move fast. Mm-hmm. They put all of put the environment first. They, mm-hmm. they do so much good for the community, and they've differentiated themselves, and and their execution is, you know, really spoken for itself. I read that zero to one book and I, it's kind of depressing in a way because it makes you think that unless you have like the next whatever idea, right? YouTube, that you're hooped. There was other video, you know, platforms on the internet before yeah. YouTube came around. I think that's, uh, you know, I was crippled by that idea for a long time. Really? That I need yeah. this like Uber-esque idea, yeah, exactly. Facebook-esque idea, exactly. right? Uber people must have thought those guys were crazy when they started, right? Mm -hmm. Like some stranger is going to drive you around in your Mm -hmm. car. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the ideas that we think are this, you know, big, uh aha, world changing idea started as something that people, you know, thought they were crazy. Right. Yeah. And it's, it really comes down to taking that first step and executing on it. And you don't have to have the next Uber to have a successful business either. Right. No, you can create, you can create an amazing coffee brand. Like, you know, you're doing with yourself. You can take, there's other energy beverages out there. You can create a better one, Mm -hmm. you know, find something, find a white space in the market or a problem that you're, you see in the marketplace, something that bothers you and solve it for other people and and help people with that. Well, that's kind of what, I mean, yeah, there's other coffee companies out there, but giving back to reforestation has kind of been our problem, if you will, trying to plant a tree for every sale. That's kind of our solving a problem i think there's opportunity in the, for the environment in that sense i love that yeah you know I mean? like simon sinek has that famous quote people don't buy what you do they buy why you do it right and you know you have a big why behind your brand and that's why it's going to be successful yeah you know, you're solving a problem well, we have a yeah. <laughs> we have a big why too and i really believe you know our early success has come back to yeah people resonating with that so you've read mg demarco I sure have, yeah. Where'd you find that book? Uh, I had a good friend of mine recommend it, and that book absolutely you know, yeah. changed my life, changed my perspective on business and entrepreneurship. And it made me understand that being an entrepreneur isn't about making money, it's about solving problems and adding value to the world. And once I changed my perspective of that, mm-hmm. my life has been forever altered. What other entrepreneurship books do you like? I'm a big fan of Andy Frisella. If uh, you're familiar with him. Ah, uh, yeah, the I have re- seen him. Yeah, the Real AF podcast. Where he's, he's like hardcore, right? He's hardcore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, he okay. kind of says the same thing as MJ. You know, true businesses that survive are ones that put their customers first and they give more value than they're asking for. Mm-hmm. And I've learned uh, a ton of, you know, what we do at Revita from from him. Hmm. What else have you read for our work week, Tim Ferriss? I've, I've never read it. I'm more a believer in the hundred hour work week currently. Okay, right. Yeah. So, but I think the principles, you know, that I've, that I understand from that book are very powerful, mm-hmm. you know, learning to delegate, mm-hmm. you know, learning to outsource some things you know, with the understanding that you still got to outwork your competition. Right. And the slight edge is uh, a book that I, okay. I love. How about you? What do you recommend? Well, four hour work week was good. That really got me going. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I think the title is misleading. Yes. Um, there's some good ideas, I thought, in that book. Shoe Dog, have you ever read that oh, one? That is one of the best entrepreneurial yeah. books I've ever read. Yeah. And that's well, that's the style of entrepreneurship that I, I it, love. Right? right. These guys that had a mission and a purpose, and they at times they suffered and it was hard and they I hit roadblocks, it. but they pushed through. And 
And, you know, he, you know, Phil Knight, he changed the world, right? Yeah. Pretty phenomenal Such a story. good book. <laughs> Such a good book. My girlfriend's reading it right now and she actually likes it and she doesn't really like those kind of books, but it's just such a good story. It's phenomenal. Yeah. Yes. What else? I've read a lot of the Warren Buffett stuff. There were annual reports pretty good. I don't know if... Yeah. Warren Buffett. Of, uh, I've read his biography. Pretty amazing, yeah. man. Patagonia story. Have you read that one, Yvonne Chouinard? I have not, but I've heard amazing things about it. Yeah. They've done a lot of environmental stuff and uh, maybe too much. It was interesting on sustainability. Interesting. How about inspiration in general? I guess you had your dad and as far as starting a business growing up, was there anyone you kind of looked towards? My uh, my parents have been my heroes. My dad has uh, quite an exceptional you know, story of things that he overcome. And he started his company, Cornerstone Engineering, when he was in his early 40s. Okay. We were just young kids at home, put everything on the line you know, to, to, to make it work. After recovering from lung cancer, effectively, really? yeah, he, he stepped out and, and took this massive risk to provide for his family and mm-hmm. seeing the impact and the jobs he's created yeah. and the people he's helped with his business never-ending source of inspiration for not only myself but but carly and rob and the whole team that was kind of your inspiration growing up i guess yeah that was my hero you betcha you kind of draw inspiration from a lot of places provided now you guys are planning on trying to grow and the grocery stores is kind of the idea then yeah though we found our uh, optimum sales strategy which we find you know the best way for us to, to scale is is through retail that's how we we get the best reach that's how we feel we can help the the most people with our product Mm -hmm. and so the plan for 2021 is to aggressively scale all throughout canada and then we're gonna step into the usa here starting in in january as well yeah where so amazon prime in the us uh, we're working on getting listed with them yep so that's supposed to be a q1 initiative and then we're just going to find the right, you know, partner to help us, you know, start looking at some opportunities, hmm. you know, south of the border. But our main focus is always going to be, you know, looking after Calgary and Edmonton, Alberta, and then Western and, and all of Canada. That's cool. Uh, you ever thought about Dragon's Den? We've thought about it and we're, uh, we're considering 2021 being the year we really? we step on stage there. We'll see what unfolds. That's cool. I had Rob Fraser from Endure Socks on the podcast. No way. I don't know if you know. Yeah, I've seen his uh, his pitch there. Did you see him on Dragon's Day? I did, yeah. <laughs> he found a lot of value in it. I mean, he turned them down. <laughs> yeah, crazy. I just find they're critical, too critical. Yeah, I don't know. good exposure, you yeah. know, and there's some incredible entrepreneurs on there that I'm sure we could all learn from. Yeah, I mean, you get a huge exposure from it. You get right? massive exposure and... At the very least, you should hopefully get some, you know, good feedback. <laughs> yeah. Probably very critical, but you know, yeah. from some some people that definitely know what they're doing. So hopefully, the next year or two, that's you guys' plan. It's on the radar, certainly. Yeah, yeah, that would be cool. Shark Tank, <laughs> Shark Tank, perhaps. I like yeah. Shark Tank a little more. It's yeah. How about tough times? Has there been any tough times in the business you guys have experienced? Oh, there's been uh, massive setbacks. You know, massive challenges. So. It certainly hasn't been uh, a straight line. And I'll tell you a couple stories. The first one's kind of funny. So when I was just getting started, I had to make my first packaging order. And the minimum order was 11,000 packages. Yeah. So we had spent months working on the package design. We ordered these 11,000 packages. I go to my very first big account to get it into the store. And the guy goes to try and scan the barcode barcode doesn't scan i printed eleven thousand packages because i just didn't know any better with the wrong format of barcode and then it gets even funnier we had a customer come to us one time they're like did you mean to like spell this word this way i'm like what do you mean and health canada requires us to put not suitable for persons sensitive to caffeine well we spelled sensitive s-e-n-s-t-i-t-v-e we put tit in the middle of sensitive on 11,000 packages so you know you're you're as a startup entrepreneur you're constantly making mistakes there's constantly setbacks i mean covid you know half the stores we were in closed down overnight and you know we've tried to just you know push forward understand things are going to go wrong and you know always focus on you know, adding value and, and helping your customers and if you do that and you keep that at the core you know of your company's values i think you're going to win long term so how much are we talking with those mistakes a package is probably what 50 cents so you're <laughs> five the grand you know. oh man i mean we've made tens of thousands of dollars yeah, of mistakes really? you know and that's that's just one 
you know, we had our first box run, the boxes we ordered were too small. So we couldn't sell first production run because they got jammed into these boxes and some of them leaked and they were munched. And when you go into an industry, you know, that you're not necessarily familiar with, your greatest asset, but also your greatest weakness is your ignorance yep. because you're going to make mistakes, understand they're part of it. I'm sure you have lots of stories and you just push through the adversity. It gets better. You learn. You yeah. just use it as, as fuel for the fire. It makes a great story. Yeah. Well, luckily you guys are well capitalized, but that could be devastating for a company. It was, it was devastating. You know, this was when we had zero cash flow, you know, I'm personally yeah. funding all of this. So this is coming out of, you know, my savings effectively yep. or yeah. money that I borrowed from, from the bank and you get sick about it for a day and then you just push, you know, you, you push through it. And what I found now is you build up such a tolerance to mistakes and things going wrong that, you know, sometimes you don't even get upset about it. You're like, okay, you know yeah. what? This is neither good nor bad. It's how I see it. I'm going to push through it. We're going to use this as an opportunity to get better, and, and we just won't make the same mistake next time. What do you do for stress? Exercise, obviously. Big proponent of healthy, you yeah. know, healthy eating and exercise. And so for me, it's always been, you know, been the weights. Right. That's been my outlet. How about you? Yeah, exercise I think is probably the best. Always been a big skier and mountains and all that. Yeah. So <laughs> during the weekends, getting out. What would you give advice to other entrepreneurs starting out? The advice I always, and we've touched on this already, but don't wait for this magical idea, yes. right? And don't even wait at all because if you're waiting for the right time, I promise you it's never going to come. You got to just start today. The right time is right now. Right. Even, you know, stepping away to do this full time, you know, I didn't know COVID was going to hit in a month. My family went through some, you know, extraordinary challenges at that same time. And if I had waited, maybe I never would have taken the plunge and, right. you know, Revita wouldn't be where it is today. Yep. So my best advice is start today, start right now. There is no perfect time. The perfect time is right in this moment. And it's all about just jumping in the deep end, learn as you go. Don't be afraid of mistakes. I've made so many of them. Mm. You will push through. And this is an incredible, extraordinary journey that'll give you so much purpose and there is nothing more fulfilling that I found than yeah. an entrepreneurship. Do you have a plan B? <laughs> no. So I'm, uh, I believe in the concept of burn the boats. If you're going to go, you're going to start a business, you're going to go for it, go all in, right? Because if you're thinking about a plan B, you know, when it gets tough and it gets hard, you might not be as resourceful. Whereas, you know, for me now, quit my job. I'm fully invested in this financially. Mm-hmm. Like, I have nowhere else to go. So mm-hmm. this is it. And so when we hit a hard time, my back's up against the wall, forced to find creative ways to solve problems. Yeah. And I think that can become a real competitive advantage right. when you're competing with big companies that have more resource and, ha- and have more right. financial backing. You know, you have that, that nitty gritty, you know, fight and hustle in you that can't be replicated yeah. easily. Yeah. When you have a mortgage, I don't know if you do or not, but stuff like that really lights yeah. a fire. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do too, you know, and, you know, I'm still not paying myself. Like that's just the, yeah. the reality is of being a startup. Yep. And, but it's been my greatest asset because, you know, I know that, hey, I got whatever, you know, X amount of months left of savings. Yep. Like I have to get to this point in revenue so I can pay myself something. So I don't have a choice. And when you don't have a choice, it's amazing the, the solutions to problems you'll come up with and, and the things that you'll do. How many stores are you guys in now? We're in 300. 300. Just about 300, yeah. And top line revenue, you guys six figures, seven figures? So we're in the, the six figures right okay. now. And, and we're how it works in the beverage business is until you're doing, you know, probably a couple million dollars in yep. revenue, you're probably not making any money. It's a growth game, as we talked about earlier, dealing with, uh, you know, net 30 payment terms. Yeah. And so the big push next year is is let's scale with quality, get into, you know, over a thousand stores and that should take us over that, you know, million dollar mark in revenue. And then hopefully, you know, should be a point where I can pay myself a, a livable wage. Yeah. But this focus still is on, you know, helping one customer at a time. You put it all back into the business. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So has COVID helped you guys? I mean, I know groceries been like ripping lately. COVID has been... It's been the, probably the greatest challenge, you know, or 
society in recent times has faced, but I think it's also a blessing to so many. And it's been a blessing to us in the sense that it forced us to reevaluate so many things in our life, right? Reevaluate what's important, but also reevaluate, you know, what was important for our business. Mm -hmm. We were growing before through doing samplings in grocery stores. Well, sampling in grocery stores is probably canceled, maybe forever Mm -hmm. for all we know. So it forced us to do things like giveaways online or we gave you know tons of samples to hospitals to nurses and hospitals and we actually scaled and grew more through that than we ever did through sampling in a grocery store which was expensive and time consuming Hmm. so we've we've looked at it as a blessing and we've learned a lot and it's helped us kind of pivot and change the way we market our business and the way we we've adapted digital marketing probably a lot digital marketing yeah would you say it's it's been a net positive or a net negative for you well yeah i mean in our case we didn't have a cafe so that was good (laughs) we didn't have to worry about closing down a cafe or anything like that and we're always built online a lot of our distribution has always been through amazon and our website i think that was good but it hasn't been easy for everybody no and i hurt you know we hurt so much for these local businesses you know we're uh to try and launch an initiative here to help some local gyms out right. that are forced to close yeah. here in Alberta. And and these are, we got to support these people because they're the, the hardworking entrepreneurs that put everything on the line to get a lease and yes. open a space to help the community. And that's who my heart goes out to is these people. And, you know, as a company, we don't have a ton to give, but we try and give back to them, you know, where we can. Well, I think that's, it's been a great summary of Revida Energy and kind of where you guys came from and yourself and really appreciate you taking the time. And Hey, I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you for creating this platform. I think it's, it's just phenomenal for, for entrepreneurs in the city and in the community. And I love your mission. I, I think Rose Bros is just an, <laughs> Thanks, an, an, an incredible company with a great ethos and I have no doubt you're going to be very successful with it. Appreciate it. We'll have to do this again sometime. Absolutely. Well, I enjoy from the that. Weeds Cafe. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Hey, thanks for listening, everyone. Hopefully you enjoyed the episode. If you liked what you heard, check out rosebros.ca where we will have upcoming shows. You can also find our coffee and chocolate there where we plant one tree for every bag or bar sold through our partnership with Mindful.